come and join us this afternoon and um, tell us about his research and tell us about how he thinks that um, uh, this can also be relevant for today. Dr. Cohn, you have the floor. Welcome here. Thank and you. I'm uh, eagerly listening to what you have to tell us. Uh, thank you. I'm really uh, happy to be here and very honored. And thank you to uh, the prosecutor and to especially to Ms. Gloria Atiba Davis, who was the chaperone of me coming here, Dr. Hans Devers, and the indefatigable of Ms. Annie O'Reilly, who really took care of me. Uh, thank you. I'm a historian. I deal with a lot of subjects. I talk about uh, historians, early historians out coming out of, of wars and the Holocaust. I'm interested in a lot of stuff, but I found myself becoming an historian of children. Now, this is not exact. That doesn't put you always in the first place in the historian community, uh, community because uh, historians are... Okay, you understand. So I thought to myself, what made me uh, so interested in children? And I'm talking uh, children when they were children, not in children when they were 80, but uh, the children when they are children. So I think there are three... Uh, I, before this, I thought, why? And I think there are three answers. I'm a, I'm a, I used to be a teacher before I was an academic historian. And uh, I, before the ivory tower, I taught classes 1 to 12 in the uh, underprivileged areas too. So I met children. Secondly, and this opened the doors with many survivors. We were talking to child survivors. Was, uh, we did, uh, my wife and I, we did uh, fostering. We had uh, two foster kids for many years growing up with us. And you now we have foster grandchildren, or whatever that is called. And the third thing is that I come from a war zone, actually. I mean, we live, uh, our, we live in the north of Israel. Our children who are today teachers and social workers and grew up as under fire from Lebanon with the air raid shelter always ready. And uh, my son, uh, when he was 15, uh, lost four classmates in a terror attack in his school. And we had to deal with that. He was saved uh, by chance almost. So the war in children is very is something we have from in home. So maybe this brought me to look at the children's moment where they were children. This is what I'm looking for. So I uh, set a, a, a pace to this lecture. I'll give a short introduction about the time period we're talking about. Uh, so let's start. Uh, numbers. We're talking about uh, the, the end of World War II. <coughs> now, the United Nations, which wasn't really established fully by then, was preparing to a humanitarian catastrophe, which was like the one after World War I, when 18 million people died out of, from Spanish flu. So the idea was that how do we prepare for a, to stop this catastrophe before it happens? They established the UNRWA, United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Agency. Not the UNRWA and not the UNRWA, but the UNRWA. Uh, the first thing was to get everyone who was a, a victim of the Nazi regime home. We're talking about 10 to 12 million slaves in Germany from all na European nationalities. They had to be taken on. They, they succeeded in doing this very nicely. But there are at least a million who would not or could not go home, and I will not say you know why. Among them, 250,000 Jews who were the remnant of European Jewry and who couldn't find a home again in Eastern Europe. Let's talk about children. Uh, generally, in the <coughs> DP community and in the victim community of World War II, uh, there weren't many children. Children paid the price of wars. We talk, you know it better than I do. We see the news. Uh, children are the first to pay the price. No matter what, uh, uh, just or unjust conflict. Children are a weak, a weaker, uh, less uh, have very less ability to manage hunger, etc., etc. I can. Uh, if we talk about Jewish children, only 11% of Jewish children survived the Holocaust. Uh, in the adults, it's 33%. So the, the the survival rate of Jewish children is by a third less than that of the adults. If we take the country where there were the most Jewish children, 
we're talking about uh, maybe two and a half percent so far of children. So the children who were there, they were the survivors of a massive catastrophe uh, of, of their peers. Okay? Uh, this uh, opened a new category that the owner was working with, which was unaccompanied children. I'm not saying every unaccompanied child didn't have a relative surviving, but it was a category of children who moved or coalesced in the, uh, Amer especially in the American uh, and British uh, occupations of Germany, children who were living in children's groups organized by young adults, usually from all national groups. We're talking about, uh, by 1947, the UNRWA says it's treating in 12,000, almost 13,000 children like that. Who were these children? They were forced laborers, not Jews. I mean, in 1944, after they, they raided all Europe for workers, the Germans needed some more, so they did a project of enlisting 10-year-olds to work in German factories. I mean, they're, they're, there's a massive, uh, kidnapping drive in Belarusia, taking children 10 years old to work in camps for the Germans. These are work camps. Then you have a children of forced laborers. I mean, if we're talking forced laborers are not only men, uh, hundreds of thousands of East European young women being, women being brought to uh, Germany to work on the farms, to, give, uh, to be operas for nice German women, and then raise many nice German children for the war effort, or in factories and camps. Now, when you have so many women and young women and men, there's also children. And these children, many times in repatriation, these children did not get home, <laughs> did not get back with the mother, we couldn't take them back, etc. So we're talking about this. The most intriguing group is, which I'm not a lot, but I will say it's the Lebensborn. Uh, Something that the UNRWA researchers find out when they get to the field, the teams find out when they get to the field that they are East European children in German families and institutions who were kidnapped from East, from East Europe in order to Germanize them. I mean, if you know the Germans killed their uh, and handicapped and uh, even mentally ill, because you need to have a healthy race, but if you want a healthy race, you should also bring in the good stock from the outside. So you uh, kidnap a nice blonde, iron looking children from all over Eastern Europe. If they make it in the diagnosis, they go to the German families uh, for fostering or adoption. If not, uh, for example, you find, if I, you find out that they have uh, learning disabilities, then they stay in some institution out on the side. Now the German families, I don't, many of them did not know they were taking kidnapped children. They knew they were taking children of ethnic Germans who lost their parents in the war. This is what they knew. Now this is a story, historians can say today, we can show the books on the shelves, but this was virgin territory. No one knew about this until they started finding out that the children were there. And then you have a, an amazing story. I, I found it out when I started working in the UN archive. Uh, child search teams, national child search teams, Polish child search teams, a uh, Czech child search team, a French child search team, roaming Germany and looking for children, checking adoption records, uh, talking with municipalities, and then you have to devise a plan. How would you know that this child is really Polish? I mean, his parents are waiting for him in Poland. But he doesn't know anything about this. He was kidnapped two years old. Is already four years old, four years in the German. Now it's really good German family. Papa and Mama. Now who are, how do you find out who he really is? So this is a major issue, I'll come back to it later. And of course you have Jewish children which no one is looking for. This is <laughs> apart from the Jews who want their children back too, and, but they were not kidnapped. They were, these are surviving children I talk about. So this is, so this is the field we are talking about. We're talking about children, and uh, I will talk specifically about Jewish children. I was asking myself, why is there so much, why do we know so much about the Jewish child survivors of the Holocaust? 
I think it relates also to the fact that Jews are a society who writes, who records. People, we have so much material around. And we don't have much for uh, Roma children or for uh, ladies born. We have research, but we don't have memoirs and personal stories and stories by the caretakers. And it turns out that uh, we're, we, have, we know a lot because everyone was writing. And there were no tapes in Europe. No one was recording testimony like we know today. When you recorded the testimony, you sat and you wrote the things the person told you. So everything is on paper. Uh, <clears throat> what can be done with all these children? I will talk in, I will divide my talk to three parts. I will talk about the macro questions. What do the agency, today we will say, what do the agencies do in our uh, language? Policy questions debated by the UNRWA. Uh, this issue of the child's best interest. And I'll talk about two micro questions because actually I'm interested in children more than I'm interested in uh, the bureaucracy of the adults. That wasn't fair to all these adults who really made an effort. But I'm, uh, let's say I'm look, I will look top down on the policies and I will look bottom up on work done with the children on the ground, which on which I'll talk about two issues. One is running children's homes, which I think is the most relevant issue to what is going on today. And there are rehabilitation and stuff. And the other is listening to children. Uh, not psychologically, because no one knew that it should be done then. PTSD was not invented yet in the 40s. OK, I'll give a brief overview of policy questions which I and others have found when we looked at UNRWA files. Now, I must say I'm not alone in this, but there aren't many researchers doing this. We're talking about maybe in the whole world 20 people are interested in this issue, and what we really want to push is getting more people into this and more research funds to get more people interested. There's a lot to be done here. So I'll talk about uh, top-down policies. First, Retrieving children to the NA, I called it before the child's best interest. Now, everyone knows you have to look at the child's best interest, but what is the child's best interest? So it was common agreement in the years following World War II that a child's best interest is to grow up in his national group. This is the child's best interest, with his national own national or ethnic identity. This is the child's best interest. I believe a uh, it would have been a consensus at that time, and I'll talk about it when I talk about the ban on adoption, that uh, the idea of celebrity adoption of choice children from several national groups, building a nice spectrum of children in your home, would not work for these people. They said this would be a, a victory for Hitler if the children will not go back to their people. A child has to grow up with these people. That's why they would take out children, labels born children from German, families, even if it meant a tragedy at the, the moment. Uh, Jews had the same problem uh, trying to retrieve children who were saved by uh, Christian uh, Polish institutions or families during the Holocaust, and how do you bring the child back to his people? You're not really saving him, he was already saved by the monastery now. What about the next stage? Okay. Second thing is that uh, the UNRWA is very idealistic. A lot of uh, women, and this is a really good place for young and professional women from the States and from Britain. They're going there and they're doing amazing work. And they have a lot of ideals, internationalists, I'll call them. But in the bottom line, they understand you must work with the ethnic and national groups. Uh, they have a major influx of uh, especially Jewish children coming in as groups, with counselors, survivors themselves, from Eastern Europe into uh, Germany. Germany becomes the haven for Jews in Europe after the war, which is Germany under American rule, becomes the haven for Jews uh, escaping Eastern Europe. And uh, they could have two options. One is we're national, ethnically blind. We believe that every, a child is a child is a child, we are building internationalist camps, we have a, this is the UN, we are 
and they understand very fast that this is not this can't work. And what they do is they work with their national groups who are already organizing their children. Meaning, it's not that these children are on the street and the UNRWA workers collect them and organize them. These children become organized. The Poles are taking care of their children, <coughs> the Jews are taking care of theirs, and they come in. They, they smuggle the border, they call them infantry, infantry children. The, these are infantry children are, uh, coming as organized groups. And the UNRWA, you can see the, the protocol say, Look, what's going on? We, we have now uh, information from Prague that every, they, they reached, they, the Jewish groups, reached an agreement with the Czech government that every week 150 children cross the border. Now, what do we do with these children? Can they tell us the numbers at least so we'll get organized? But they understand they have to work with the national teams. You can't fight the national entities. So you have to work. Now, if you do that, then what, what is your role? Ask the UNRWA. Your role is training the staff of these groups. This group, they, no, no one is professional here. We are talking about young. So I, if you talk about the Jewish case, young survivors, smiling the ball. It's young. Uh, we we'll call them today in American terms the young adults who are running ch or, or young, maybe a bit older, young people running children groups over the border. Now, they have no training, most of them. They don't know, they have no uh, pedagogy. Most did not learn education or social work, or they, they had a war on their hands for the last six years. So uh, what you can do is work with the, with the national teams, and this is the whole idea of, uh, mental, of, of convincing the caretakers to listen to professionals which is not easy. Uh, okay. Another issue they're deciding quite early is to separate youth groups or children's groups from the adults. Not, if you have a family, no one is separating anyone. But, uh, so in all the DP camps, you have schools and uh, clubs and whatever. But when you're talking about the independent groups, so we're talking maybe 10,000, maybe 15,000 children like this, the atmosphere in the, let's call it by name, a refugee camp of adults who were traumatized during the war is not always conductive to building a good education for the young people, and not good role examples. And, anyway, so, and I'm talking about an amazing society of the DPs really bounces back and builds institutions, cultural institutions, if, uh, has political uh, arguments, uh, is a press, whatever, but the belief is that the children will be better off with the peer group. And what they do, they decide to establish kinder lagers, children camps, and you've got a five, which I know, I, I found the protocol with five, maybe there were more, uh, camps meant for teenagers especially, or even younger groups, and without the whole uh, uh, problems of the adult community. So this is something that uh, must have also been uh, a change from things that they were thinking before. Last thing I'll talk is about adoption. I think this is, uh, uh, we did fostering, not adoption. I mean, our kids, foster kids had parents when we were in touch with the parents. It was even done by agreement with the parents, not uh, by court. Uh, a lot of people from the Allied armies and the Allied aid agencies and the Allied government ruling Germany saw the plight of the children. They, you know, children always move something in your heart. And they wanted to take a child, children back to the States, to Britain, to France, wherever. I mean, they can give them a good family, good education. And they start applying for adoptions. And they. I don't know how much it takes. I, I, I don't, wasn't able to rebuild the timeline. But uh, at a certain moment, there's a decision that no one adopts anyone in Europe. In, from the uh, DP children, from the survivor children, the whatever. Because of, uh, I think, two reasons. One is, these ch you really don't know if these children have a family or not. 
I can give you an, a, an example. In, a, in, a, in an organized setting, this is a, a I saw this in a, a books on adoption in Israel published in the 50s. And they were talking about the case which some of friend of mine researched later on. A girl was in the children's homes. The children groups, many times the, pe the parents gave the child to a children's institution. Because then they knew first he'll have bread on the table. And secondly, you have a chance of leaving Europe earlier than the adults. So you have to uh, help people have the child leave. So now this girl came with a group, a mother gave her to a children's home. The children's home reached Israel after an only say throughout Europe. And uh, she came to Israel five years later. And she, we're talking about Israel an immigrant country where there are four immigrants to every old timer who was an immigrant 10 years earlier. So there's a big mess, and she can't find the child. And she looks for several years, and she can't find the child. No one in the Ministry of Interior, no, because she can't find the name. And then one day she meets a caretaker from that group, and she said, oh, oh but this is obvious. We called her by another name. With a nickname for her. That's the name she was probably came into the country. So they found the child. It turns out she's been adopted by a really good family who uh, lost their child in the war and adopted, gave a good upbringing. And something like 10 years after she last saw her mom, she finds out she has a mother. And that was not easy at all. So adoptions were seen as problematic. And the idea was that a child has to grow in his national group. It's better for him even to be in a good children's group than to be adopted by some foreigner and taken somewhere else. Okay. Now I'll talk about work on the ground with the children. Rehabilitation. What you see here is a very nice uh, a photo from one of the children home in Poland. And you see children studying under the writing is, we go to school. We have to remember children didn't go to school all those years of the war. Uh, let's talk about the problems of the children we're talking about. We're talking about a problem of identity. We mentioned this with the Levens born children, but Jewish children who, who were hidden by all sorts of families and institutions had a really big problem. Even when they were, uh, I can talk about, uh, uh, even when you remember that you're a Jew and you write your name in the inside of your code so that you remember who you are, you still believe in Jesus now, and especially in uh, Maria. That's where you find solace for your soul, in the church. Now your uncle comes now, your parents were lost. Your uncle is here, he wants to take your... Now, we have in all those children's homes, problem what they call them the monastery girls. Really, girls with strong Jewish identity and Christian identity, and Christian means Polish at the same time. Okay, so the question of identity for children is very strong. These children underwent loss, and they saw the loss firsthand. This is not, we always try to hide our children from death. Don't look at this picture, don't, don't, we will not go to the outcomes. Uh, uh, funeral, etc., etc. But uh, these children saw it firsthand, and they now have trauma, of course. Apart from what they saw on their family members, etc., we're talking about children who underwent traumas. This is uh, these children, the Jewish children especially. We have to remember we're not talking about children who get hit in the war as collateral damage, which is bad enough. I'm not. Underplaying it a bit. War is hell, children pay the price, uh, we don't do comparisons. But these children, <coughs> at the, one, at the small 2.5% in, in Eastern Europe especially, were targeted to die. They knew they were on the, they didn't die as collateral damage. Especially if there's, I can recommend to you a book by uh, in Indiana University Press by Jan Grabowski called uh, Jugend Diagel, like Jew Hunt. And he talks about uh, the periphery, a child hiding in the forest who he knows they'll shoot him when they meet him, when they see him. 
It's not that uh, you can stay there and no one will see and uh, they ignore you, not help you, but ignore you. Okay, major problem. For children in this story, and I think this is always children at risk, uh, children today in the war zones are super at risk. Distrust, mistrust, distrust of uh, adults, of society, of law. You can't, be, uh, no, trust is a major building block of our society. You trust the policemen, I suppose. To. You trust your headmaster, you trust your parents. Trust is a major building block of society. Take this out, the whole thing falls apart. These children, like many other children who weren't, have no trust. There was one child who was interviewed, I'll talk about her later. She's in a, she's been interviewed about her experiences and the, 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 the adult who's writing down it uh, gives an appraisal of her and he said, she's fidgeting, she's fidgeting all the time, she doesn't sit straight. And I found a testimony for many years later and she says, when uh, she is a survivor by a real survivor, and she survived alone from all her family, running away every time that she had to run away. First thing, she'll come into a room, she'll check how do you escape from this room, window, other window, high, door, how do I escape? So of course she's fidgeting. A physical condition, we're talking about kids, children who were at a war, this was a long war, uh, etc. And we are talking about children who never got education, or maybe some had a semblance of some education, but we are talking many years without education. What do you do? And what you see are two amazing women, Lena Kiefer and Hasia Beliska, these are English language books. Uh, I researched the phenomenon of young survivors, women, building children's homes for children right after the war, before aid came from the outside, before people came from uh, missions from Britain and Palestine. Uh, these people were working in the communities with, before any agency, there was money from the joint coming in, but nothing else. Took time for this too. So they were asking themselves, how do we build a home for the children? Now, it's not only for the children, like if you see below, joint destiny, the motivation, they're saying very openly, it's for us as well. We also need a home. We don't also don't have a family. This building the home with the children is not only for the children. It's for us. Uh, so the first issue is food. Us call it food security. It's about having food on the table, not having to hide it under the mattress like all the children did. And every one of them tells in you know, the marriage of the children hiding food under the mattress. And the whole idea is not only having food and having a big bowl of bread, basket of bread, on the table, all the time, refilled. So you can take as much bread as you want you to understand what this means for kids who are in a hungry diet. But I want you to look at this picture. These children are eating with a semblance of civilization. There's tablecloth on the table. They're sitting in small groups. Now, I, I, why is this so important for me? Uh, my, uh, we had foster children, and uh, very weirdly, our kids, my daughter at the age of 20, she, once she got married, they were offered a children's home to run. And they did this for four years. She, I mean, she was 20 years old. Suddenly she had 12 kids. Oldest one was 18, youngest one was six. And they did this for four years. And they were in a very supportive environment. But if one of the first things she did, and she didn't listen to my lectures, was deciding to cook at the home. And when I went to the memoirs, all of them are talking about this. You have to cook at the home, not bring catering in, not go to a dining room, come to a dining room in the nearby institution. You have to cook, you have to have the smell of food, you have to have the children taking part, and you have to serve it not like in a dining room, but in a familial setting, which is exactly what you see here. So, I was really moved when I saw that she got it too. A warmth. This is a family. This is not an institution. Uh, dreams. They were doing a lot of uh, uh, what we will call today uh, dream therapy or whatever. They were 
dreaming about the future together, they're playing. And it, again, it happens in several places, building a story, what we have. Let's talk about the kibbutz we'll build together. This is now dusk. Uh, uh, Moishe is coming back with a, with a herd from the field, and uh, trees are this, and, and it was playing this a lot, having dreams, having some uh, identity by choice. They understood very strongly that you can't force people to change their identity. And although sometimes the funding, the big agencies were not as, didn't have so much a patience for the children. They knew that you can't do it without patience. And this is a, it's amazing stories, but they all go back to the same thing. You, you have to get the children very slowly to accept what they want. And you can't force identity on children. In promised land, I must say that uh, for the, uh, the fact that they were unwanted, uh, all the kids, children did not have to be told that they were unwanted in Eastern Europe. They felt it on their physically after the war. We're talking about, and uh, the fact that there is some land we're going to, which is Palestine, was very strong. And so now I'll go to my third thing: is that is listening to children. This is a part of the Jewish bookshelf after the war: anthologies of children's testimonies. And I have uh, several slides like this to put all of them, but I'm. I decided to work, go on this one. Uh, you've got Yiddish, Polish, and Polish here. I can show Hebrew, etc. 1947, you have three anthologies of children's testimonies written or interviewed by, of interviews of children done right after the war. 1948, you have four. You've got all sorts of stuff going on. Turns out that someone was listening to the children. And they... This idea that you have to... No, they were not psychologists. And they didn't know what psychologists know. And also, Hasia uh, Bielitska herself says that in a memoir, she said, look, we were... Uh, she was the youngest of them all. She was 24 when the war finished. And then she was in another children's camp. That was a detention camp, a British detention camp with a group. They were detained on Cyprus. And the uh, kids were again, be, again behind barbed wires. It wasn't nice. And she said, we didn't know what to do with the kids, but no one knew better than us. And she decided to take their stories. And they had like two weeks of everyone telling his story. And she said, it's like the past coming out. But this was intuitive. We we're not talking about uh, a psychological weather I told. I said before in the preliminary talk here that there were hardly any psychologists around in Europe, in liberated Europe, or anywhere. Just might enough for the numbers we're talking about. So the teachers did what they did, what they knew, and they all knew you have to take the children's stories for several reasons. So what you have uh, in 1945, you already have a booklet explaining how to take testimony from a child. This was published in Poland in two languages in 1945, in print. And uh, not everyone read that, but it was there on the table, and people were using it or doing it by themselves. And uh, she, and the idea was that uh, you have to uh, take down the children's stories for several reasons. You have to know what they went through. This is not a coincidence that teachers are doing this a lot. The understanding that if you want to work with children, you have to know what these children went through. This is the amazing part, that all the children who weren't, didn't have a chance to tell the teachers what they went through, how did they manage? I'll say, in short, a, a friend of mine, I told him I'm coming here, I told him what I'm talking about, he said, look, I managed first time, my parents are about eight, I managed to get them first time to talk about their experience as all of us children. One was in the monastery, the other was uh, somewhere else in the family, and the parents were all in Auschwitz, came back, uh, and then they went back to their apartment in Western Europe, where they were thrown out, they were stoned in the streets, no one attacked them, so they went back home, sent the kids to school, and that was it. No one 
interview the children, no one listened to them. There were no peer groups of children who went through. So, in a way, these children had it the worst. They survived by not speaking by the, later on. Once they didn't speak in the right time, they didn't speak at all. First time they spoke was last week. We're talking about people who survived 1945 as children. And this is an example of the, uh, Gloria saw this. And this is an example of, apart from the questionnaire, the idea was not to use the, uh, there was also to take the historical story of the child, but the idea was not to get the child to tell us the history. This will fill up from the adults. What, we, what you can see in this part of the questionnaire is, on one hand, information relating to children, and the other hand, what the child experienced. The feeling, if you look at the top, the question 23, what kind of children's institutions were there in the ghetto? Children's home, boarding institutions, semi-boarding institutions, children's corner, children were, uh, education was not allowed in the Warsaw ghetto, and we're talking about 100,000 children. So uh, the most strong social agency in the ghetto was the uh, uh, house commissions. So the each house, each block had a commission, and each commission, each block had a corner where the kids were taught. So children's corner, club, school, illegal schooling, what kind of literary institution did you attend, where did you study? It, I mean, you don't find adults being asked about children's institutions for some reason. What kind of study did you study? Now let's try and talk about feelings. These adults were never asked. Did you go to the institutions willingly, or were you forced? Preferred running in the street, begging, earning. Did you want to be with children, adults, or alone? When were you sad? When were you happy? It's amazing that the children were asked all this stuff that the adults should have been asked too. But no one thought about this. Okay, did you like studying, working, praying, or were you hard to motivate without interest? This is not simple, getting the children to talk, because some people, many people, thought that it's wrong to get the children to talk about their experiences because it opens wounds. Today, again, I'm saying, today we are used to, to speaking about uh, the need to debrief everyone who went through a trauma, etc., etc. Now we are starting to rethink this again. Is this really the good thing to do? Because we, some people survive by not talking. So when I lectured about this in the States, someone in the audience scared, students said, look, I was a teacher in Berlin of DP children. My father was the assistant high committee, uh, military governor of uh, whatever, of Germany, and said, we got a specific directive not to talk with the children about the war. All school essays, all poems, either before the war or after the war. Why? Why open the pain? So this is some, uh, there's a lot of uh, subtext about this, and the uh, open text to this. So the German occupation lasted for six years, robbed and crippled the children of their childhood. This is from this 1945, uh, work. Therefore, one of the most important tasks of the pedagogue, teacher, educator, is to provide the child with the conditions to retrieve his childhood years. We might not wish to arouse memories of the recent gruesome past, but if we want to learn about the psyche of the Jewish child after these difficult experiences, we have to confront the child with the past. Now, this is so modern, super modern for 1945. I mean, these Eastern European Jewish educators and intellectuals were, were the cutting edge of um, educational work with children. So, I promised I will not do it too long. Uh, for conclusion, I'm not the only one doing this, and I would have given you a list of names and others for my colleagues to be uh, known for posterity on the tape, but I would not do it. I'll just say, there's a small group of people in the world who are looking at this time and this situation and this issues. I think that uh, if people have the Holocaust thought uh, never again, it turns out that it's again and again and again either genocide, just wars, and uh, all this. Uh, we want so much to build a better world, but in the bottom line, we find that children continue to pay the price. And this is why I think it is so important, historically wise, to research this post war and post conflict situations, not only post war post-genocide situations, in order to have some sort of uh, earned wisdom that people working today will be able to use to expand their minds. 
I also think there should be a way to build a discourse, a talk between people working today with all these issues in the field or in the offices here, and the people looking at how it was done yesterday. Now, I'm not saying that we have the answer to today's problems because even then they didn't know what the answers were. But I had the chance to see a bibliography for aid workers, a Canadian one. Someone sent me when I was working on these issues. And there was nothing about the post-war period. Now I'm just saying, I mean, the best thing they got to the close to the, I'm not talking about even horror, the, best, the closest they got to the Holocaust was some, one paper they referred to on the psychological problems of child, of second generation. Now, look, there were children out there. There were adults too. There was a genuine effort by international a agency and by a lot of good people from the ethnic groups and the nations who were victims to do this right and to build something better, if you, if you talk about the change, to build a better future for these children. Therefore, I think we must find a way that, I'm, as an historian, I can say, this is really burning uh, inside me. How do we make this information that is closed, not closed, it's open, but you have to go to the UN archives and getting in is not simple, I can tell you. Uh, to read it, how do you get this stuff out to the people who work today, and the po both policy makers and the people in the field, so that they can have a wider worldview when they come to treat the problems ahead? And uh, I thought I was leaving the field to be an academic historian in the ivory tower, but it didn't work out. <laughs> I'm still trying to connect what I do in the Ivory Tower with what is happening in the world today. Thank you very much. So thank you very much indeed for uh, that uh, no interesting, yeah, sure, for that interesting presentation. I, uh, I can imagine that uh, uh, there may be some questions in, uh, uh, in the audience. And, uh, who could I give the floor? Yes, Hi. Uh, sorry. Uh, just say thank you very much. It was really interesting. Um, a little question. Nowadays, there's a lot of children who are both um, perpetrators and survivors at the same time. I was just wondering what, if you think they should be punished or rehabbed and cared for, or both. That's all. Thanks. I know this is a major issue here, especially. I don't know what has to be done. I think that everyone has to be accountable for everything on one hand. On the other hand, what we have to do is, I don't, uh, is to look on how we can uh, stop the world from getting to this place. I mean, uh, I'm not a legal advisor. I know so since uh, the Salzburg conferences were, I mean, the glory, but the last three were till this is a major issue. and. Uh, I don't know the answers for this. This is too big for me. James, you have a question? It's coming. Dr. Cohen, I wanted to ask you about Rwanda, if you have any views about that. Um, the reason I do is because I remember reading, I worked in that but I remember reading uh, three fascinating studies by Jean Ensfeld, uh, a journalist, who focused on uh, survivors of the, of the genocide in, in Rwanda, uh, but adults, and uh, also focused on perpetrators, and then did another uh, book about uh, the integration of the two as people were being released uh, from, from, from prison. But I don't remember him focusing on children, and I'm wondering if you're aware of any uh, particular focus on the, the child, children who, who went through 1994 in Rwanda and whether or not anything that uh, you've been talking about has been applied uh, to deal with the trauma that those children suffered. Well, we know that the whole uh, genocide commemoration of Rwanda is built on Holocaust commemoration uh, specifically and that the U.S. HMM is uh, 
is uh, the Oakland Review in Washington is recording uh, one of the testimonies, as is the Holocaust Foundation established by Spielberg, is also recording, apart from its uh, 52,000 uh, Holocaust testimonies, it's recording Rwandan testimonies. So, amazingly, the Rwandan story, uh, I, and I know the people involved, this was done uh, with a clear mind to put the Holocaust people from the UK inside Rwanda and teach them the works. I didn't see things about children. There is an interesting collection in the uh, Rina Library. I saw it uh, when I was there last of children's drawings from Rwanda. So uh, we know also in the DP camps people were recording children by their drawings. Uh, using drawings to get the children. Oh, this was done in Rwanda too, and the collection is in a, in the Wider Library in London. So if anyone is interested, it's open to the public. You can see it in the archive. Yes, please. Yes, good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, um, of course, well, I, I probably have a million questions actually to ask you, and uh, of course we could talk about all of the many uh, genocides and uh, holocausts that have occurred and unfortunately are still occurring. But uh, to come back to the specific question, um, I'd like to refer to something that uh, a program that was on the, on BBC television on Sunday, um, in, uh, and of course in about ten days' time it will be the United Kingdom's uh, Holocaust Remembrance Day. 27th of January. Yes. And um, the, que the program uh, was uh, quite an unusual one. It was a program which is normally about um, people's uh, antiques. And they bring along their antiques. You probably know that the Antiques Roadshow. Yeah. Yeah. This was a specific one about uh, the Holocaust, and the premise was for people to bring along um, physical mementos of, uh, of the Holocaust. And um, obviously, one of the recurring themes of the film many. Um, one, one is uh, the thing you already mentioned, which of course, as children and as young people, they found it extremely difficult to talk about at that time, and therefore spent, uh, many of them uh, died without ever talking about it. Many of the survivors still don't want to talk about it. But also, um, but now people are beginning to talk about it. Um, Possibly because, of course, of the, of the situation facing the world at the moment. Um, another running theme was um, the idea that children actually have a, often a, an unexpected reaction to the situation of war. Obviously, the, the horrors were horrific to the children, but some aspects of, of wartime were actually exciting or adventurous or even fun. And those are things that people don't always talk about because it, it, it's counterintuitive. We don't really want to say that. It sounds as though we're, uh, we're lessening, we're belittling the, the, um, the horrors. But I thought that was, that was something that kept coming up because, of course, these people were showing physical objects which uh, many of, uh, in many cases had actually um, brought back happy memories, too. Uh, and another thing that uh, one of the most uh, poignant and uh, indeed horrific moments of the program was when um, one person brought in from, a, um, from the Holocaust Museum in the United Kingdom uh, a board game which was produced in Germany in the 1930s. That board game, which of course was aimed at children, uh, was built on the idea of... Um, well, it, the game was called um, Jews Out, of course. Um, and uh, the game in, entailed rounding up Jews in your local community. And it was aimed at children, and it's apparently sold in huge numbers. And of course, there are almost none of these games left because most people, uh, as you would expect, destroyed them out of pure shame after the Second World War. Uh, but there is one in the museum in Britain, and they made uh, quite a, a point of showing that, to show that propaganda is often actually aimed at children and to stir up hatred towards other children. And that's something, if we're looking at lessons to learn, surely that must be one of the greatest. Yes, of course. I, I was talking about not talking. We have to remember that this window of listening to children was very short. It was, uh, 
It finished in 1950 at the top. Once these children got out to their respective destinations, which is most of them to Israel, the second biggest group is to the States, Britain, no one asked them anything. I can't find any material about asking children their stories once they get to their destination. I, I can't find. Uh, although this was very strong in the bookshelf, <coughs> the bookshelf in Israel, in the, maybe in the States, but in other places, no one, uh, not many, or we don't know of any recorded effort to listen to the children's stories after. It's, uh, secondly, they grew up. I mean, children is a very dynamic category. You don't, you can't stay there. And what, if we talk about a child who was even 10 years old, uh, 12 years old when the Holocaust finished, ended at 45, this is very banal what I'm saying, every place is different, but if maybe he was 12 years old, by 1950 he was 17, he was enlisting, he was building his life, he went to work, he went to study, I mean, he was not a child, he was busy building his life, so he had a whole long period of not talking because why talk? So I think that the real amazing stuff is that it happened, it had to happen in this uh, fantasy world of the DP camps of Poland after the war, before the pogroms. It has to be happening in this fantasy world where the world was on hold and you didn't know where you're going tomorrow and this was a time you could get people to talk and you were interested in listening to them. So about games I would say that uh, if researchers of life stories who look at change changes in testimonies can show that <coughs> as the years go by, people look more fondly or even they are more forgiving to the people who blackmail them or if they save them and blackmail them at the same time. We, we have a lot of gray and zones. But uh, in the same they will talk about play now, there's a, there, there was a past breaking book called uh, Playing the Holocaust. And, but it didn't, uh, when I started studying academics, we were really looking down at it. Truth is, the issue of play is very important. Every place the Germans conquer, one of the first edicts from the military government is throwing the Jewish children out of playgrounds. I, I, it, it's, you think this is what you're busy about? But it's somewhere in this uh, big uh, law, German uh, operational instructions for military governments. Then uh, it can be your first thing, fourteenth edict. It can be this issue of throwing Jewish children out of playgrounds and swimming pools, of course, parks, recreation, recreational. This we have dates how it happens. Now we can see that. In the big ghettos, you have an effort to give the children playgrounds. There's an effort at building playgrounds in the ghetto because the Germans, because people knew children had to play, so there was play. And in Israel, also, you have a, every several years, you have a massive drive of asking people to clear their homes and bring stuff to Yad Vashem. Turns out that Every time they do it, and there are two competing museums doing it now, and also the Ghetto Pilots Museum, uh, they get tons of materials, and every item has a story, and of course there's dolls and games. People are set in hiding places. What did they do? They played with lead soldiers, they read a uh, a medical encyclopedia that was there, there was one child, that's what she read. Uh, they uh, in, built, invented doors, of course. I mean, well, what else would they do? People were also playing. But, as you say, it's not always nice to say that everyone was dying in the university of play. Yeah, like, uh, the amazing story is this one example who was in uh, his. Uh, uh, so that is, he, had made a, he made a lot of inventions later, so his uh, survival story is uh, depicted. He, there were five people in the hole in the ground for more than a year in the Ukrainian family, uh, uh, the mate's family, under the floor, and there was total darkness, and his uncle taught him physics by heart, by, ro by heart, no books. And the guy became a major inventor, and is a he died not long ago with a giant uh, technological empire. But he learned his physics by heart. 
uh, by, in darkness, under the floor. That's where it all started. And they had to keep the mind alive, like you see. Yes, hi. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I just had a question. I was wondering, in terms of the impact of uh, you mentioned that the children after the Holocaust were not given an opportunity or encouraged to open up and talk about their experience and that the trend is changing now. We're encouraging children, uh, survivor children to speak up. Uh, are you aware of any studies, comparative studies, on the impact of these children as they grow up between those who opened up and those who could not talk about their experience? Thank you. This is an excellent question and no one really knows. I can say that no one has proven that the children who did give testimonies had it better than those who didn't. No one can prove this. And everyone quotes a, a, a research which I didn't see about uh, survivors of the underground bombings in London, which shows that those who, kept, who didn't talk all the time about it made, had it far better than those who went back to the story and told everyone about it and gave lectures about it. The ones who didn't talk with this, it, it's counterintuitive to all what we say about debriefings and PTSD and stuff. Turns out, one, and there's a new research, uh, someone told me about another uh, catastrophe somewhere. It's not obvious that they had to talk. What I'm saying is that there was a window of opportunity where it was considered important that they would talk. Not everyone agreed, but those who believed in this. I refer to uh, the first m m uh, feeling done in Poland after the war by Jewish survivors, the, play, the, the artists are child survivors. And it tells the story of children in a children's home who a, a group of artists come to the children's home, I'm putting it all short, and uh, they perform, the children perform, and in the end the artists say, look, we have a competition, you were in the Holocaust, uh, we need materials for our lecture, for our shows. So tomorrow morning we will hold a competition, everyone will talk, and uh, we will uh, decide who's the winner. Now at night, the building is, it, it's built like a Hitchcock field. It's very good, it's a big, tall building, <coughs> and the guy, the, everyone goes to his room, and the artists are downstairs, and they start climbing, and everything, they, they go to a floor, they see in the room someone is telling his story. Now the stories are based on three real stories of Holocaust survivor, child survivors, and there's the story of the matron of the home who lost her child. Now, terrible stories. This child was, I, I will not tell the stories, but what it means is that they go up and down, and in the end they reach the room in the attic, and one says to the other, this was a mistake, we should not have come here. This is not a children's home, this is a nightmare. This is a, 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 the house of horrors. And somehow they fall asleep. In the morning, they wake up to the noise. Look for the window. The kids are playing. They are reenacting some of the things that were said yesterday. They are joking at the expense of the artist. They are really playing. And then they understand that kids are much, much stronger than adults. And they're saying this. this is the movie has a message. This was done in 1948 in Poland. Uh, was screened, it was not allowed to be screened in Poland, it was screened in the Western world and Israel. It is said that it made, uh, through two screenings in the crowd, uh, there were panic attacks in the crowd and they stopped showing it. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a film by comedians. But the idea is you have to reach to them and they have a message. The children are stronger, they dream about it anyway, so there's no problem to do drama work with them. It's better to have them talk about the stories and in the morning they can play and be happy. Now this is, again, we're talking 1948, 49. This is not today with all the psychological knowledge we have. So we don't really know. There's no research. I, we couldn't find any indication to show that a, a child who spoke had it better than one who didn't speak. And some people, some children we found who gave testimony in 45 in Beton, Poland. We found a notebook, a friend found for us a notebook done by a teacher, surviving teacher, surviving children, 1945. He writes down the story, sends it, well, we found it in New York, and we published it in English, by the way, if you're interested, in the Journal of East European Jewish Affairs. It's called The Notebook from Beton, 
it's 70 stories by children uh, that the, children, uh, the teacher wrote down. And uh, I don't know why I told you this. Uh, 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 so we have a, we found, we wanted to publish it. And the Yirbo archives were very hard with us. And they said, you have to do the effort to find the children. Of course, we like that. So we did, we found the family of the teacher. We got permission to publish. But we also found seven of the children. We went through the internet, Israeli press, Israeli radio. We found a friend, found a friend, found a friend, found the seven or eight. None of the children remembers giving testimony, which is for every child testimony we find is the same. None remembers giving testimony. And from this specific group, no one whom we found gave a testimony later. And we offered them, the, uh, do you want now to give a testimony? So, why didn't you talk about, why didn't you give a testimony? So I decided my kids would have a healthy upraising, upright, uh, uh, will be raised, upbringing, upbringing so too much work. Uh, healthy upbringing. They, I have a son who's a professor in uh, uh, the field of science, a daughter who teaches in high school. I succeeded. I didn't want to grow up in a Holocaust house, and I never spoke. And it's fine for me, and I don't want to speak now either. So there's, who knows? Another one told me, look, we had Auschwitz for breakfast, Auschwitz for lunch, and Auschwitz for that, and, and we wanted to go on a roots tour to Europe, but I, I, I took, it take, took 10 years of therapy to get me able to go and look for my family's roots in Poland, in the Ukraine. So we don't know what is right here. The, the, the belief that the best thing is to talk psychologically, I think it is being questioned today, as far as I know. And I think with the children we talk about, we see too. If there are no further questions, I suggest that we wrap up. And uh, in that case, I would like to thank you very much for your uh, inspiring and also moving presentation, I must say. It's, it's always good, and uh, you illustrated that very well again, uh, to, to learn from history, to try to learn from history as much as possible. Uh, I, for myself, I hope that you will continue your uh, uh, fascinating and important work. And uh, I will try to benefit from it in the future. Uh, where I can, and uh, well, thanks again for uh, having shared this with us this afternoon. Thank you very much. It was an honor and pleasure to be here. And we academics just give us a chance to talk. <laughs> oh, and uh, one last, uh, more administrative thing. Uh, perhaps I can ask all of you to uh, uh, take a look at the form that you will find on your seat and uh, inform us of uh, uh, what you thought of this and how you think we should proceed in the future. Thanks for that. Thank you. Thank you.